Okay, well, let's get started. Good afternoon, students, employees, and community members. I am Erin Cunningham Ritter, representing the College of Arts and Sciences Be Well program, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this Let's See You Well event titled Financial Freedom and Happiness. Don't work for your money, learn how to make your money work for you, featuring Diane Hirshhorn, who is a lecturer of finance in the Leeds School of Business and also a wealth manager. Before we begin, please note that closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcription button on the menu bar. Also, this session is being recorded and will be posted to the Be Well website, along with additional wellness resources, research, and workshops all on the website. We've built in time for questions at the, and answers at the end of today's presentation, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our Lex, Let's See You Well expert of the month, Diane Hirschhorn. Um, Ms. Hirshhorn has over 20 years of wealth management experience as a financial advisor, providing complete wealth management strategies to clients. In addition to lecturing at CU Boulder, she is currently a consultant to J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, and um, previously she worked as a manage managing director at First Republic Bank and also at Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs. During her career as a wealth advisor, she's received several industry awards, and at CU Boulder, she was a Marinus Smith Award recipient. Ms. Hirshhorn received a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from Cornell University and an MBA from the Anderson School at UCLA. She's also a certified private wealth advisor. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to Diane Hirshhorn for her presentation titled Financial Freedom and Happiness, Don't Work for Your Money, Learn How to Make Your Money Work for You. Diane, welcome. We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, so much to everybody for participating and uh, devoting an hour of your time to a quick lecture on financial freedom. It really helps me if you don't mind turning on your um, video because I don't I don't care if you're eating whatever you're doing it just makes it so much easier for you to pay attention and for me to pay attention and um, if for any reason I'm speaking about a point and you have a question in the middle of the lecture please raise your virtual hand I'm happy to address the questions as they come along. And also at the end, this is your time and I'm trying to uh, speak in a way that makes hopefully the best use of your time. So, um, and hopefully you'll participate as we're going along because it just makes it so much more fun and interesting. Okay, just my background we already went over, but what I really wanted to tell you is that I spent many years protecting and growing the super wealthy, like money for the super wealthy. So my smallest clients had about $10 million and my largest clients had more than $100 million. And I just realized one day, wow, do I want to devote my life to making the rich people richer? Because so many of my friends and my family members, professors at CU Boulder, like even people in the finance department know a lot about the theory sometimes about investing. Most of us aren't taught basic skills. So I want to just tell you a few observations I had during my career, what I learned from uh, the rich and the wealthy, and kind of share some tips and tricks. Like, what do I think you should know? How can I point you in the right direction? You do have to say that nothing I say is really investment advice today. It's not estate planning advice. It's not tax advice. We're going to talk about all three things briefly. Um, but I just owe it to you to say, I don't know your personal situation and nor am I in a business professionally right now of providing personal advice. So just anything I talk about, I'm going to provide you with some resources at the end of the lecture, but understand whatever you're going to invest in. Don't just take a quick lecture, a YouTube video, a TikTok video, and assume it's appropriate for your situation. So hopefully today we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of financial independence. We're going to, I'm going to teach you how to earn more interest on your bank accounts, um, how to set a retirement uh, goal, and then give you some tips about investing. So I'm going to open this up to the floor. Does anyone know what these people have in common? Can, can I just get some guesses here? And if you could raise your virtual hand, I'd like to call on a couple people. 
So does anyone know, just guess, what do some of these people have in common? Oh, come on, I need a few volunteers because you do not want to hear me sing the Jeopardy tune because I have a terrible voice. Thank you so much, Michelle. They're all wealthy. Uh, they did earn a lot of money. <laughs> Anyone else? How do I raise my hand? Eric. Uh, they probably all filed bankrupt bankruptcy. They did. They did. So Michelle, everybody guesses that these are all people who made enormous amounts of money. So Mike Tyson, for example, had career earnings in excess of four hundred million dollars. And I start with this because it's so interesting to me. Most people think if I want to create financial independence. If I want to retire well, like in a decent lifestyle, I need to earn oodles of money. In fact, I really don't think that's the case. Does anyone know what these four gentlemen have in common? Four people, anyone? I get a few volunteers. This is going to be a very long hour if we don't get volunteers. And also, Erin, I see some people on the chat. If you don't mind monitoring the chat, and if there's something time sensitive, just ask me. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Glenn. What do these people have in common? Well, as a political scientist, I can acknowledge they're all American presidents. Exactly right. And they have something else in common. Anyone else? So all four of these men went bankrupt as well. And so <laughs> I find this so interesting because... First, we saw some really famous actors and writers and musicians and athletes who went bankrupt. And then here, are arguably some of the most powerful people, is certainly in the United States, and, and I think one could make an argument in the world, and they all went uh, bankrupt. So just earning the money, just having access to some of these resources isn't the key to become financially independent. So I wanna to talk to you broadly today about three facts that are gonna set you free. I do have to say that my dog has now uh, escaped from his room. And if you hear him barking in the background and going to apologize in advance. So fact number one, seriously, people, I could think of a lot of four letter words to describe this. I'm gonna say people stink at money. Like all of these people stink at money, right? Just making it didn't help them. This one was fascinating to me when I first was in grad school and I got offered a job at Goldman and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the best firm at that time on Wall Street. I'm going to work with the super rich and famous. I'm going to be with in some of the most beautiful houses and talk to some of the most interesting people I could find. And they're going to, of course, be super happy because they have everything that money can buy. And one of the biggest surprises is that rich people aren't any happier than you or me. In fact, I'm going to make an argument that they're less happy. In my experience, what do they have? They have great toys. I've been in some of the nicest houses I'll ever be in. I've been in fancy cars. I don't even know the names. It's so sad because my husband's a car guy. I'm not. So it's lost on me, but they're not happier. And so what I want to ask you, does anyone know what these two people have in common? Anyone know what these two people have in common? Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, they both killed themselves. They both committed suicide. And um, so, and I could give you countless examples. I had several professional actors as clients. I had a famous uh, musician, one of the most, she sold more albums than most not happy people. So just again, earning the money was not the, the principal idea. So I want to just take a slight sidebar and ask you, does anyone here remember your favorite birthday gift growing up? And I want to put parameters on this. I want it to be, let's say, from zero to, I don't know, 10, let's say. Let's say three to 10. Nobody remembers the first few years of their life. So your favorite birthday gift but I wanna put the following parameters. It can't be a vacation. It can't be an experience like a trip to Disneyland. It can't be something that you had a relationship. So for example, it can't be, I don't know, 
uh, someone gave you a dog, um, a meaningful stuffed animal that somehow you you felt as if this was an imaginary friend and you had a relationship. So out of the entire group, I won't call on you yet. I'm just going to ask you, can you please raise your virtual hand if you remember a favorite birthday gift? It can't also be money because that's just not the point here. Like, so favorite birthday gift, please raise your virtual hand between the ages of three and 10. Okay, so I have a few people. And if you're part of the majority that don't remember, congratulations. Almost no one knows the answer to this question. So why am I asking it? What's the point? Most of the things that we get in life, we all have houses or rooms, if I'm a student listening to this, full of stuff in our closet, in our basement, in our garage, that we were so excited about to begin with. And it's really just stuff. And so I can tell you my clients had some of the nicest stuff, some of the nicest toys. But if I pulled you again and asked you, what did you get last year for your birthday in the last 12 months? So it can't be in the last few months. Most of us aren't going to remember unless it involves some unusual experience. And so what, what it helps me understand is really, we just, maybe we're not focusing on the right thing that really brings us joy or happiness. So I'm going to hopefully try to teach you a set of skills so that you can understand strangely it doesn't take that long to become financially independent. When I say financially independent, what I mean is that my portfolio or my assets are generating enough income so that I don't really care anymore what else, like I don't have to sell my time for money. That's really what we're doing. When we're working at CU, we're trading hours of our life or money. And most of us have to do this. And so there's a way of achieving financial independence in 10 years. For some of us who have a lot of student debt, who have other forms of debt, it may take us longer. But for many of us, we can really, we can really achieve this. Most of us, when we graduate from college, I think that in the same 10 year period that I could become financially independent, I almost in, uh, encumber myself with so many possessions that I, I almost feel obligated or I have to work just to pay my bills. And so I say to my students, like really what most of them do is they graduate from CU, all of us graduate from different colleges and we get these jobs and maybe we're not so passionate about them. And if I pull my students, the first thing most of them want to do is they want to get a cool new car. And then maybe they uh, get married and they buy these fancy cars and rings and houses. And instead, I'm going to make an argument that part of the path is going to be consistent, meaning I do graduate, I get a job, maybe I like it, maybe I don't like it so much. For most of us, work, they don't call it play, they call it work. And so we don't, often don't get to choose something that we're super passionate about. So instead of spending that money, if I take that money, invest it, I can achieve freedom. And then when I think about freedom or retirement, I actually achieve, achieve personally financial independence at the age of 30 and a half. I always say that because I was just so average in every way. If you were to ask my high school um, uh, contemporaries, they would just be shocked with what I'm doing professionally. They'd be shocked if they knew that, you know, I really get to teach now for the joy of it. And so what financial independence is or retirement, you don't have to stop working. It's just suddenly I can do things I'm super passionate about. I can teach at CU, which is such a privilege, without worrying about, wow, how much does this job pay me? Is this going to pay all my bills? So do I have to be Warren Buffett, probably the most famous investor for most Americans? Do I have to win the lottery? No, absolutely not to do this. I can do it on virtually any income level. And I want to talk about how can we achieve financial independence? 
So the first lowest hanging fruit, I say low hanging fruit to my students. And what I mean is if you went to an apple orchard and you have a choice of all the apples and they're all equally ripe, my favorite fruit to pick is the apples that are on the lowest limbs, right? Equally ripe, beautiful apples makes me the most happy because I work the least for it. So here's a very simple idea of how you can make more money and I call it low hanging fruit without taking a lot of extra risk. So I need participation again. Can I, can you raise your virtual hand? I won't call on you without your permission, but can you at least raise your hand if you currently have a bank account at any of the large banks? So let's just say it's, um, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Key Bank, um, any of the big banks. And so if I continue to do this, I'm going to guess at least half of us do, at least half of us do statistically. For those people and for the rest of us, I want to ask you, okay, now only raise your hand. Well, raise your hand. I won't call on you yet. Raise your hand if you know how much interest, what interest are you earning on your bank account? Can you raise your hand if you know? Please raise your virtual hand. I won't call on you yet. Do you know? Are there any other people who want to raise their hand? I won't call on you yet. Okay. If you are part of the group that doesn't know, first of all, kudos to the six people who raise their virtual hand that you know how much you're earning. Almost all Americans don't. Ask tonight at the dinner table, ask some of your friends, anyone. Most people don't. And I'm going to say opportunistically, if you don't know how much you're earning on your bank account, this is an opportunity for the banks. The banks know this. Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're huge, well-respected banks. They know that you don't monitor the interest that you pay them. So clearly, it's not in their business model. Oh, well, Diane, I really think you're my favorite client. I'm going to give you a really great rate. Why won't they do that? Because I'm not even monitoring it. So I think it's worth, after this lecture, go online and look up the interest rate. In fact, it's probably pretty obscured on your bank statement. This exercise came up because I realized most of these banks... I worked at Merrill Lynch. It was bought out by Bank of America. So I'm going to specifically pick on them and chase because I'm a consultant there. What interest rate are they, are you earning? Most of us on this uh, meeting right now are earning 0.01%. That's one one hundredth of 1%. One one hundredth. So this exercise came about because when my kids were little, I, you know, I wanted to get them excited about like investing and learning. Yes, I was that mom, admittedly, that sent my two children to bank camp. So they have a lifetime of being able to complain about me. So I realized when we opened up these bank accounts and they got paper statements, which I chose just so that they would see their money growing, it'd be exciting for them. It cost Bank of America more money to mail them a statement each month than the interest they were earning on their bank account. It's like, wow, like, what is this? Can you do better? So here is just, when I prepared this presentation a week ago, here is just a sample interest rate from Chase. It's going to be 0.01% or 1 100 of a percent for almost all banks, almost all of the big banks. So I highly encourage you after this, Go to the, your bank's website. It's going to look something similar to this and look up how much interest you're earning. And so then the question is, like, let's just say I have a student who comes to me and they're in my class and they um, have $100,000. Clearly, most students don't have $100,000 at a bank account. I only put this number down just so we could do the math very, very easy in our head. The principle is going to apply regardless what balance you have. And so I'm recommending three different red websites that you do research. I will give you a list of resources. You don't need to look this up now. Three different websites that you can go to and basically shop around 
for bank interest rates. And here's the amazing thing to me. Mm -hmm. If I were to pull you and ask, how many of you, how long did you spend buying your last car? And most people honestly are going to say, I don't know, at least 20 hours, maybe more. What an exciting purchase. Most of us don't spend that same time either finding the right bank account, finding the best investments, understanding it. And so I'm just encouraging you and going to provide some resources so you can do this. So in this situation, here's three different websites. My favorite of the three, if you only want to look at them, again, I'm not affiliated, is Doctor of Credit because they don't get paid any kind of referral or affiliate link. So they have the most information, but the other two websites are better known and they're pretty terrific as well. So any of these are good. All three websites will help you improve the interest on your bank account for most of us. So I just went, this is an example of a page from a week ago from Dr. Credit. My search was savings accounts, high yield. That was all I put in. And it's going to give me a page of probably 50 to 75 banks. I only screenshotted the top few just to make a point. Here, I can earn 6%, 6%, not 0.01%. There are lots of different choices that you're going to see between the ranges of 4 and 6%. So without taking any additional risk, here's low-hanging fruit. I can dramatically improve at least the return have some of my money immediately start working for me without me selling time. That's what's happening when my money is working better for me. So in this case for Alex, the student who had $100,000 hypothetically in a bank account, is it worth his time to change accounts? Yes. If he picked this one bank, you don't have to pick that bank. There are a range of different banks to choose. His total interest for the year would have been $6,000. His total interest on $100,000, if it was in any one of those other banks we talked about, again, I'm really not, I worked at these firms. I'm really not trying to pick on them. I'm just trying to help educate you all to be a better consumer. So he would have earned $10 if he kept his bank account as it was. Now we can earn 6000 So he's almost earning $5,990 more. To me, it's going to take, sometimes my students say to me, well, really, Diane, I don't have time. I don't have time to do this. I'm going to do it later. We all tell ourselves lives like this all day long. I'm going to say, I would seriously be looking at this idea now. Um, is my billable time worth it? I'm going to say yes. Really, if you're not getting paid in this case, probably take 10 minutes worth of work to open up a new account. You need your social security number and um, uh, your address, that's it. You can transfer the money electronically, probably takes you 10 minutes. So I think it's completely worth looking into. One big caveat is you wanna make sure the bank that you choose has FDIC insurance. This is insurance, we read about this in April of last year when there were a lot of bank failures. Essentially, it's insurance that's provided by the, the government so that to the extent your bank goes bankrupt, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, and so on, if they go under, your account is insured for up to $250,000 per social security number. So my husband and I together could keep, we wouldn't, is there better places to invest, but up to $500,000 in one bank account. So I would make sure you wanna make sure this is money for peace of mind, right? That's what your bank account is giving you to facilitate transactions, peace of mind. So make sure any new account has FDIC insurance. I provide a link for it here. There'll be logos on these three websites are recommended. At least in my experience, I haven't found a bank that they recommend that doesn't have FDIC insurance, but please make sure of it. You want to make sure that the minimum balance, you can meet this minimum balance because otherwise you're going to pay all kinds of extra fees. Most banks, most of the ones that I, I have found on these lists have very low minimums. Their model, their business model is quite different from, let's say, the brick and mortar, um, Chase, um, Bank of America, and so on. But just make sure that you're not paying um, extra fees. 
I often get people who say to me, but Diane, the rate could change. Of course the rate is going to change. But I generally have found in my experience, those banks that are advertising these terrific rates, that rate tends to go up and down along with um, uh, interest rates. So a bank that, for example, Ally, Marcus, SoFi, uh, Synchrony, all these are terrific banks. Their rate does change, but it's, I haven't seen a model where they've gone from, I don't know, four or 5% down to 0.01%. And by the way, if they did, great. I can spend another 10 minutes and another few years from now in changing my account. The other thing that seems to overwhelm people is they want to find the perfect bank, the perfect investment, the perfect everything. Get over it. Like, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. My bank right now is not paying me 6%. It is paying me 5%. And I am thrilled with that compared to 0.01%, which is what I used to earn a while ago. So it's good enough. It is not good enough for me personally to earn one one hundredth of a percent when I can earn so much more. Alleviate yourself from the pressure of I need to be perfect. So the next thing we should teach students is how, how do I set a retirement goal? And I like to think about this because retirement, again, that doesn't mean stopping working because technically I could have retired, but I'm teaching at CU. And so it's just that I get to teach for the joy of it. That's what retirement is to me. And so I, I like to think of, I was trying to run a 10K a number of years ago, and it was in Broomfield. And the thing about the 10K is you need to know where you're starting the race and where you finish. And this day that I woke up, I mean, it was pouring out and I'm definitely a fair weather runner. <laughs> And so I show up for this race and instead of having, I don't know, there were supposed to be hundreds of people, thousands of people who showed up. I was one of probably 15 people. And there was one volunteer who was running this. And there was a 10K at the same time as there is a half marathon. So I'm running, I'm running. And I realize about an hour and a half into this 10K, I mean, I am slow. I'm definitely slow, but I somehow ended up on the half marathon track. I was like, oh my God, the signage was really poor. No one told me where the end of the race was. She was so embarrassing because I had to cut across, look like I was cheating. And I think this is so important. We need to understand if we're expected to fund our own retirement, how do I figure out how much I need? And so it's actually a pretty simple formula. If you want to audit or come to my class, I go into a lot more detail and what's good about this rule and what's bad about this rule. But at least, at least let's, what are the limitations? At least let's have an understanding. So some academics got together a while ago and they said, hey, the study, if you want to look it up, it's called the Trinity Study. And essentially they said, hey, most people retire when they're 65. And so how do we help people come up with a guideline if I retire at 65, or maybe I retire at 50, whenever I retire, if I want a portfolio to last approximately 30 years, 30 years, because originally it was, I'm 65 and I want to live until maybe 95, I take my annual spending, whatever I want to spend in retirement, for all of us, that's going to be a different number. And I divide it by 4%. That's it. That is the end of the race. It's so simple. And so, for example, if I have a, if I'm a, uh, right now, I want to spend $50,000 a year in retirement, how big should Sophia's portfolio be? Like, what is going to be the goal? It should be $50,000 divided by 4%. So her goal, the end of her race is $1,250,000. And similarly, if Lee wants a portfolio that's going to generate $100,000 in annual retirement, inflation adjusted, how much do they need? They need 2 million, uh, hang on, let me just show you, $2.5 million. Now, this is a little more complicated, and I don't have time to teach you all of everything I know in just a few short moments. But essentially, the other thing I want you to think about when you're setting your retirement goal is, hey, if I want to spend $100,000 in retirement and I'm a student and I'm 22, 
If I only save, and I say only because it's a big number, if I save $2.5 million by investing, that will not get to me my retirement goal because I'm looking at $100,000 today, $100,000 today. So I really need to grow whatever my projected annual spending in retirement, whatever that goal is by inflation so that it's, if I want to retire in 20 years from now, it'd be $100,000 growing by about 3% per year, right? Would be my amount that really I want to spend in retirement and then divide that by 4%. I can walk you through the, that math a little more clearly if you wanted to attend some of my classes, but that kind of gives you some of the basic and you can look this up. It's really not hard. In fact, Warren Buffett once was said something like, investing is simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy because we on Wall Street want to use all of these um, words and make it seem so complicated so that you need to hire me. So you need to hire me as your advisor. I'm going to say, I'm going to recommend some books. It's not so hard. It's not so complicated. You do need to budget, right? You need to budget because essentially you need to either increase your income. There are lots of great ways of doing that or decrease your expenses. Because no matter how much I teach you about investing, unless you save money and invest it, we're wasting each other's time. So the classic way to budget is, I don't know, there's tons of tools out there. I go, either go on Google, there's a really good spreadsheet on Google called the 50, 30, 20 budget. You could look that up. And, or there's lots of tools. I'll show them to you on the next page. And I set this budget and I try to live with it within those means. And I'm going to tell you, I don't live by a budget. My, my college student who just graduated, who had to set it up, we set up the budget to begin with, to set some goals. He's not budgeting, not one of my clients budget. I rarely meet people who actually monitor their expenses. A few people, but most of us don't. So what I advise my students, what I advise my son, we need to prioritize saving. Most people, again, this is Warren Buffett quote, most people spend first and they save whatever is left over. And what I want you to do is reframe that. I should be saving 20% of my money, 20% of my money. And I can walk you through some spreadsheets if we had a lot more time of why that number is important. And so what I would recommend you do is if you're a CU employee, like CU is going to get you part way there because they mandatorily put, you may make you pay 5% into our 401a a plan. And then they match it by uh, two cents for every dollar, $2 for every dollar I put in. So you are already, if you are a CU full-time employee, you are saving 15%. I'm going to suggest you try to bump that up to 20%. And then just spend what you have left over in whatever ways is consistent with your values. If you are a bit more interested in budgeting, I will give you a list of tools later. Here are four fantastic tools. There are so many great budgeting tools out there. You could also Google 50, 30, 20 budget. And there are great Google templates that will get you there as well. I did go through that exercise. If you're a senior right now, if you're young in your career and you're trying to make decisions, how much of a house can I afford? Uh, my son's case is how much can I spend on rent, on food? It's great to think of these things ahead of time because that helped him set the right budget for how much you can spend on a mortgage, on uh, on rent and so on. After you've done that initial spending, I just said, please sign up, max out on things like your Roth 401k and so forth. So that is much easier for most people to do. Now I want to quickly talk a little bit about, okay, so now she just said I should be saving. Doesn't she understand there's so many investment choices out there? It's so confusing. I'm overwhelmed. Of course you're overwhelmed. Again, people like me try to use language to make it so hard for you to understand that you feel like you need to hire an advisor. I'm going to make an argument that you, many of us, are fully capable of doing this on our own. So the first thing I'd love for you to think about is save more and invest more today. I don't care how much you're saving now or how much you're investing. Um, 
the beauty of of saving as much as you can as early as you can is there's a snowball effect your money ends up growing like a snowball and soon your money starts to earn money so you want to take a quick break here for a second and say to you does everybody we've talked about warren buffett he's arguably one of the world's most famous investors his annual return is 22 percent per year huge. The stock market on average returns 10% per year, and he's returned 22%. So there's a reason why we know him. But I want to throw this out to the group. Has anyone heard of Jim Simons? Jim Simons. Does anyone know who Jim Simons is? Okay. So here's the thing. We haven't heard of him, and yet his annual return is 66% per year. 66% per year. Buffett, who everybody knows, he truly is a genius, and he's returned 22%. And yet there's this person out here who has returned three times as much as Buffett, six times as much annually as the stock market, and yet we don't know him. Why? Buffett actually started to invest when he was 10. So it's not just that he was very good at investing. He had the beauty of time. The bulk of his net worth has been made after the age of 65. Jim Simons was a professor at the State University of New York, and he taught, I think, mathematics. And he realized, hey, he actually invented an area or helped uh, grow an area of hedge funds that use quantitative methods, like math methods, finding models to build and grow and find um, pricing discrepancies. And he's very good at this. So don't feel too sorry for him that you haven't heard his name. He's probably worth north of $28 billion, except Warren Buffett is worth a hundred million, a hundred billion or north of that. So he's worth much more. more. Why? Um, Buffett started to invest at the age of 10 and uh, Simon started to invest heavily at the age of 50. And so investing early, you could spend all the time in the world trying to obsess over how do I find the best money manager? Your, your efforts are wasted. Just start to invest. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so I'm going to give you two easy tools that you could consider. Again, you need to research these and understand them. Um, one way is called index funds. Another term for this, it's a slightly different in instrument, and it's called an ETF. And the CU401k plans, or is it 403b or 457 plans, are alphabet soup of investing. Okay, there are lots of them. Um, we are offered the choice to invest in what's called an index. And an index is basically a group of stocks the most common one is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Most of us have heard of that. We've also heard of things like the S&P 500. Some of us have heard of something called the MSCI, which is the Morgan Stanley Capital Index. It's an international index. There are tons of these indexes. And basically, it's almost like a barometer. It's a metric. It's a group of stocks that there's a group of people, depending upon the index, who pick these stocks to represent whatever they're trying to represent. Okay, the S&P 500 is meant to represent US industry. And so here's just a visual example. Here are 10 companies in the S&P 500. And basically what the company that produces this index, Standards and Poor's S&P, picks these stocks for you and they represent an index. So an index fund is not trying to beat the market. It's simply trying to do as well as the market, as well as the market. So people look at me, my clients used to look at me and say, hey, like we are like crazy wealthy, crazy wealthy. And what you're asking me to do, Diane, is invest in something where I'm just gonna do as well as the index, as well as the index. Aren't I hiring you, Diane? to do better than the index, to do better, to beat it. And what I'm going to say to you is over long periods of time, most mutual funds, most people who are what's called active investing, active means they're trying to beat the index, they fail and they fail miserably. So this is just one chart showing you that I could spend an entire lecture showing you 
that and teaching my clients over time, if we invest in these index funds, we're going to statistically be in the top few percent of all portfolios. I don't need to be the top 1%. I'm super happy guiding my clients to be in the top several percent over time. The longer the time period, the more confident I am of this. And there's been oodles of academic research supporting this. And when I was working at Goldman, at the time that I was hired by them, I picked them because at that time, many years ago, they were considered like the most elite, the best firm on Wall Street. It was equivalent of like a Harvard uh, education. Okay, I got to join this firm because they're going to have access to the best resources. It's a great firm. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of great firms, but it turns out that the mutual funds, the individual portfolios, the managers I was picking over time were underperforming. I felt terrible. So that's what led me in the early 2000s to switch all of my clients investing to what's called a passive, a passive and index fund strategy. And before you um, say, wow, this, I still don't get it. Why would I do this? Yale, Harvard, Princeton, all of these huge endowments use this strategy for their stock allocation. There's just so much academic research that would support this. So that's option one, index fund. If I'm looking in my 401k plan and I'm not sure what is an index, usually it either says the word index Sometimes it uses like words that mirror a certain benchmark, like, you know, the S&P 500 fund. So I would look up what that is and it would lead me to believe it's an index fund. The second thing I would look for in my 401k plan is I would make sure the fees are low. At see, we're so lucky. There are lots of choices for these index funds within um, our retirement plans. And I can also quickly see them because the fee structure is so much less than some of the other investment choices. So I'm going to just talk for five more minutes and then I'm going to open it up for Q&A. So option one is pick these um, index funds. It puts me in the top few percent of all investors over many years, at least if they perform as they have historically. Option two is let me invest in called in something called a target date fund. All a target date fund is, is essentially I am hiring a, I don't know, Vanguard, TIA, Craft, um, Fidelity. It doesn't matter which one I pick. Cheaper is better. But I'm hiring someone to help construct a portfolio for me, a very inexpensive, usually index fund usually index funds. I would really only invest personally in one, not investment advice, index funds that are part of a target date fund. And what they do is they say, oh, well, my son's 22 and he thinks he's going to retire, I don't know, let's say in 40 years from now, I don't know, something around 2065. So this fund target date, it's called target date. It's one of your options at CU in your retirement plans. And it gives me just a a way of the fund saying, oh, I'm really overwhelmed. Do I need bonds? Do I need stocks? What else do I need? The fund does the rebalancing for me. It's a set it and forget it strategy. And for many people, emotionally, it's better for them because then they just alleviate some of the stress of, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. Essentially, you are paying a small fee. Those are the best ones, small, small, small fee. CUs are small fees. And they pick a series of different dates depending upon when I'm retiring. So it could be 2065. Maybe if I'm just about to be re- retired, it'd be 2025. So the only thing I have to do is figure out when hypothetically I want to retire. That's it. So a couple other things I wanna point out before I turn it over to Q&A in four minutes. General rules for successful investing. When people wanted to hire me, like, you know, they're they're thinking that I'm going to somehow come up and tell them exactly when the market's going to correct. And then they would say to me, hey, this is all they want you to do, Diane, all they want you to do. And they put that word all in quotes. Could you just get me a reasonable level of return? But can you please, all I need you to do is 
before the market corrects like it did in 2020, like it did in 2008 and 2000, just, you know, sell because, you know, you're a professional show, sell all my assets. And then, by the way, can you please invest them? exactly at the market low. And so I have to say them, look, I'm not Houdini. I'm I'm really I'm not a magician. I'm really sorry. I can't control the market. I can control your risk. I can minimize your risk. But you're not hiring the right person if you want someone who can exactly time market low, market high. And so in my classes, I don't have time to do this now. My class knows that I'm I'm very frugal and what I and I never want to take a bet unless I'm going to win. And I'll offer them a hundred dollars if they can find someone who's famous for market timing. And I'm happy offering the hundred dollars because there isn't someone. Some of you might say, oh, but in 2008, these three people predicted the market crash. Or some people might say in 2020, there was someone who is really famous. And indeed, when the market goes down next by a lot, you may send me an email saying, ha, you're wrong. These people predict predicted it. And what I'm going to turn around and say to you is, guess what? A broken clock in your house is right twice a day. And I have literally never seen someone who can consistently, who's figured out how to consistently time the market. So get over it. Stop trying to do it. In fact, if you're younger, even at my age, I would say to you, if the market goes down and I have a consistent long-term strategy, I would say, even though it's going to really stink, it's painful for me to see my account worth so much less, maybe 50% less, 40 to 50% less than, less than the last two crashes I've lived through. And what I try to remind myself is, guess what? These stocks are on sale. So if I was willing to buy them a few days ago and they were expensive and now the market is down 10 or 20% a month later, I'm getting a better deal. I'm getting a better deal as long as I have time, time. I'm not just about to um, retire. Okay, what can I control? I can't control, I just said to um, you, the stock market. I can control my taxes. So the best way of doing that is to take advantage of your retirement accounts, like 401k plans, 403b plans, 457 plans, 401a plans because I don't have tax penalties for the way I invest that money. Control the type of investments. I just talked about target date funds. I talked about index funds. This is just my view. This is not investment advice. I'm a little leery about some of these insurance products that are out there because they tend to have very high fees. I'm not talking about things like um, term insurance, certain insurance on my car, for example, certain insurance on my house, right? I'm trying to prevent myself uh, from like insuring myself so that if my house burns down, there's money to replace it. What I am talking about are whole life policies, universal life, various annuities. I could give a whole lecture just on this. I would really proceed with caution, just my opinion, not investment advice, there's oodles of fees baked into them. Any fee I pay that insurance company or someone else, I don't get to keep, and it lowers my return. I would really be careful of minimizing your death debt. One of my favorite people that I have met was um, the founder of Vanguard, which is a very famous um, brokerage firm that's very inexpensive. And if you really want a really good book on investing, it's called The Little Book of Common Sense Investing by Jack Bogle. And one of the things he did was he said, stay the course. So I know the market's going to correct again. I don't know when, but my kids who are working really hard at this stage of their lives. I just said, hey, like we need to go into this knowing, knowing we will never time this. It's going to go down and we should be prepared and stay the course keep on investing. Another investor who I really love, if you are younger, or even if you're older, he wrote a free book. You can get it for free on the internet. His name is Bill Bernstein or William Bernstein. The book is called something like, let me think about it in just a minute. Um, I'll get you the title. It's just escaping my right now. It's a free PDF. And essentially, 
you know, he ends up saying, hey, like, educate yourself, young people, like, start to read some of these books, and you can learn how to become uh, financially independent. And what he said is, hey, when you've won the game of investing, essentially, when you've won the game, which is I have enough money to retire, um, stop playing. And so what I want to leave you with is, where does this all lead me, retirement? Work is so much better and so much more meaningful when I can help people like you, when I can hopefully inspire some of my students that if you achieve financial independence, whenever you can do it, maybe they can end up doing great things with their life, solving the environmental crisis, like all kinds of things. If I don't care about only trading hours of my life for a job I may or may not like, like. And so for me, like being able to do this is just an amazing, amazingly lucky thing. It also enables me to spend time with my family, which is like my number one value. I've tried to jam in as much content as I can into 50 minutes. So I'm gonna stay for 10 minutes for q and I'm a little disturbed by one thing and that happened. Like we had so many people at CU who've said to me, hey, I would love to take your class. I'll tell you what it is. It's Finance 2820. If I have room in my class, I would love to uh, you to audit it. I would love CU also to be able to offer it to the faculty one day, to staff members, to everyone. I think this should be required education. And essentially I gave you cliff notes. I just tried to give you a few teasers to make you interested and exciting, excited by learning about your finances. It's empowering and it's easy. And I'm going to recommend two different other sources. There's a book that's called A Simple Path to Wealth. For those who don't want to read it, it's by J.L. Collins. There's a Google Talk, which is essentially a an hour-long TED Talk. Google sponsors these um, um, meetings just like this one for an hour at lunch. And the speaker that you want to look at is J.L. Collins. He wrote that the Simple Path to Wealth. And I love this book mostly because it was a series of letters that he wrote his daughter. He really wasn't intending to be famous. He just wanted to teach her about investing. And I think he does it in such a really nice and simple way. Um, so I recommend that book. Anything by Mike Piper, P-I-P-E-R. He has all of these guides on taxes, on investing, and retirement that are wonderful, wonderful books. 100 pages or less. Okay, that's what I have for you. If you want to either sign up, I'm going to see if I can start some kind of class um, or something that is offered to other people. It may have to be privately because I'm not sure that CU will sponsor it. Um, but I just, I feel that the fact that so many people signed up today is an indication of there is a great need and this information is not complicated to understand. It is simple. It is simple. And um, and so if you want to sign up, I'll see if I can either start some form of a distribution to either teach online to um, to maybe do TikTok, which I hate. Generally, I have to say that personally, I'm not a TikTok person. Students want me to do it or some other form to help educate people from a honest, incredible source. That's what I have for you. I'm turning it over to Q&A. I will stay Diane, on the Thank you so much, Diane, and um, please feel free to add your questions to the chat. A couple have come in already. When you were talking about selecting your bank, Heidi asks, how often would you recommend checking on the interest rates? Um, I, I would probably, so every time your bank changes the interest rate, they actually have to notify you. And so most of that's done electronically. And so I get an email periodically and I do check it. At a minimum, I'd have a date with myself once a year. Once a year, I think everybody can do. And just make sure, hey, what is my rate? And you don't need to be perfect. You don't need that top rate. It doesn't have to be the top. But there's such a big discrepancy right now. I would spend at least five minutes once a year checking my current rate. That doesn't mean changing the bank if it's not the top rate, but if there's a huge discrepancy, I'd be thinking about that. What else? Excellent. Thank you. Um, Alex writes, whoops, lost it. Um, would money going into something like an HSA count as savings in the 20% model? It does. In fact, I'm going to also say to you, if you have debt and you pay off debt early, 
that should also count as savings. It's just too much pressure to have a lot of debt. So paying off debt early counts as savings. Opening an HSA, which is a healthcare savings account. I absolutely love these. We qualify for them at, um, at CU if you have a high deductible plan. Whether it makes sense to have a high deductible plan depends on your individual health situation. But what most people at CU don't realize about these healthcare savings accounts, they're also what's called a stealth IRA. For those who are interested in the subject, I would do a quick Investopedia is a great resource on the web. Another great resource is a group called the Bogleheads um, or a general search, Stealth IRA. And what they'll say is at CU, at most places, they actually give you the chance to invest this money. And it's what's called triple tax free. It's the only investment account that I can think of that's triple tax free. I don't pay taxes when I first um, put the money into the HSA, so it's tax deductible. I don't pay income taxes. Um, it grows tax-free, and when I take money out, the distributions, as long as they are for health purposes, are tax-free. I could give a whole lecture just on this. If you want to learn more about it, please look up Stealth IRA HSA. HSA, Stealth IRA, and it will walk you through it. We have the ability to do it at CU. It's a great type of investment account. Thank you so much. Irina asks, if you predict another financial crisis is about to happen, can it help to switch to a conservative investment rather than more risky? So Irina, great, great question. And this is almost like the holy grail of investing, right? This is why people want to hire me to begin with, because they want me to predict when the market's going to turn, um, put it in a safe investment. There's no method out there. There's no method I have seen that effectively can do this, can help you time. There's an interesting book. It's highly readable. It's called The Psychology of Money. It's a terrific, terrific book. And it will discuss in there as part of it, like, why is this so hard? Like, because there is investor psychology, just because something may have reached fair value, suddenly it's a little expensive. It doesn't mean everybody else isn't going to get super excited about it and make that price or that stock go higher and higher, higher, right? So it's just so hard to predict these things. And I might think the market is expensive. I may be able to hedge or reduce risk. Super, super hard. So my answer is, it, in my experience, I haven't found a model that will consistently do that accurately. And also every time I buy and sell stocks, I have to, or bonds or anything else, if it's in a taxable account, I'm paying taxes on that. And taxes kill your investment return. And so for those two reasons, it's very, very difficult to do. Next. You know, I just want to be mindful of time because I know you have a hard stop as well as some of our participants. We're already seeing notes in the chat. A couple of questions have come up. Diane, if it's okay if I pass them along to you as well as the author of the question, I know you won't be able to get to everything. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'll stay on five more minutes for anyone who five wants minutes. I've got to go. Okay. And in the meantime, I just want to be mindful that some people need to sign off. So thank Absolutely. you to all of our participants. And while we're at it, still together as a group, um, let's do a big round of gratitude to, to Diane for her expertise and obviously um, her care for our community. So Diane, thank you so, so much. Thank and thank you, you to all of our for coming. Thank you so much for coming. It means so much to me. Really, I love doing this. So thank you for inviting me. Thank okay, you. I'm still staying on for just a few minutes to the extent there are sure. other questions, everybody can yeah. drop off. Megan asks, could you please explain ESG investing? Yeah, ESG means environmental social governments. Essentially, it's a way of investing according to a series of criteria. There are different ways of measuring this criteria that are consistent with like either environmental values, social values, the way companies are run. Again, I would turn you to Investopedia is a great resource on the web that has a very short video that you could watch if you want to learn more about it. Great. Um, maybe time for one more? 
Sure. We'll see. Okay. Lee asks, how do you feel about Vanguard money markets? I noticed ours has a good rate, 5%, but has an expensive ratio, 0.11. Should I change to a savings account that doesn't have an expensive ratio? Yeah. I, so that's a personal investing question. And so I'm going to say defer and say, I can't give you um, individual advice. I can say, first of all, it sounds a little higher than I would expect of 0.11 from Vanguard. If you, you should check at Vanguard, usually they have two classes of investments and they have what's called Admiral shares and then also regular shares. The Admiral tends to have slightly lower fees. Um, like their a money market fund at Vanguard probably serves a different purpose from a bank, a bank I'm using to pay checks, right? Like to write checks or like auto pay, bill pay. I don't believe at this point I can do that at Vanguard. A Vanguard money market fund that's invested in treasuries though is a pretty darn safe investment, at least historically, because it treasuries are instruments of the U.S. government. So if you want more information on that, I would definitely ch check with Vanguard. Their website is fantastic and has a wealth of information that helps describe the differences. Excellent. Um, we see lots of questions coming in the chat. I'm happy to pass them along to you, Diane. Um, I know you've got to run to your next, doing a podcast I next. I do. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I just love this. And if I could be helpful in any other way, I will try, Erin, to pass up maybe a list of resources that we could share with people. Um, uh, so if they want to learn more, um, again, I offer to the extent there's room in my class and see what allow me. If they do allow me, you're welcome. If they let me um, offer it to you to audit, I have to just say that I have some space constraints and I hope to form a better way of teaching people like broad, more broadly than just my undergrads. Thank you so much, everyone. I so Thank appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. It. Thank you, Diane. Bye. Everybody, bye.